the, the uh, imminency and uh, the dangers of climate change are becoming much more noticeable, Madam Minister. That's why you have repeatedly said we have to walk the talk, we have to raise the ambition, we have to step up the efforts. And, and you're leading by good example. You've put forth a plan in the UAE that cuts emissions by 40% by 2030 and become net zero by 2050. Now, you're of course one of the biggest oil and gas producing countries attempting to lead the energy transition here. That's quite ambitious indeed. So I just wanna give you all a story. I know you've heard a lot of speeches, but I just wanna share something with you. I was in Iceland two weeks ago and what I saw there, and of course being close to the glaciers, um, what is climate change about? It's because the ice is melting. And because the ice is melting, you're having this whole ripple effect that's happening. So when you want to explain to a child what is climate change, it's about we've disrespected nature too long. We're seeing the glaciers melting. And by the way, they told me a fact which really scared me actually. If a quarter of the Greenland ice masses melt, this leads to a two meter sea level rise across the globe. This is huge. And you actually hear the ice melting the whole time. It's consistently melting. You see the ice breaking and falling into the water. So actually seeing these things with my own eyes was a, was a huge eye opener. Now, when it comes to us here in the UAE, we've been very serious about the whole climate change journey. I mean, we ratified the Paris Agreement in 2016. We were one of the first in the region to do so because we understood the implications. We understood this is a serious uh, um, subject that we have to follow. So we directly set up, also Mazdar was set up in 2006 because already our leadership said we need to diversify from where we get our energy. We need to build the knowledge because, ladies and gentlemen, it's not just about putting money into making a facility. You need the intellectual transition as well. You need the capacity building. That's why we're always talking about a just energy transition. And by the way, COP28 is going to try to solve four things. First of all, it's about the just energy transition. And because ourselves as a country are going through we are going through this transition. We understand we need political will, we need money, we need to build up the national capacity, we need to diversify. We know from experience what it means when we talk about a just energy transition. And everyone needs to do it in their own ways because every country is different, is at a different level, has accessibility to certain uh, financial uh, funds or no funds. So it's really complicated. The second thing we'll be looking after is fixing climate finance. That's a huge deal. That's kind of the enabler in everything we're trying to do. And of course, His Excellency Sultan, the COP28 president designate, is really pushing for the $100 billion commitment. The uh, uh, loss and damage fund is another area that needs to be fixed. The whole financial institutions needs to be re-looked at so that money can be accessible, available, and affordable, and needs to go to the places it needs to go to. The other aspect we're looking at is making sure that nature, people, livelihoods is in the center of COP28. It's so important to think of the food systems, to think of health, uh, to think of nature, make nature our ally. How can we use the, the force of nature to our benefit? And we need to do that. And then of course, the inclusivity. We are trying to make the COP28 the most inclusive COP ever done. And what I mean by this is the indigenous people, the women, the youth, uh, faith-based organizations all coming together because what they, f they have in common is about we need to do more to respect nature and bringing them all together and making sure that all voices from across the world are here is our commitment. What's so important, Ali, I'm so sorry because I'm very passionate about this, is that we need to bring hope back to this whole process. We need to enlighten the young people because this is about their future. We need to showcase solutions and technologies and innovations, which I've seen to be able to scale that up in the places that's needed and make sure the funding goes there. So the UAE walking the talk, yes, we have updated for the third time our second NDC. 
to 40%. Last year we were at 31%. And look, we were just, and we were improved it by 9% in one year. And this is to show, because we can see technologies are maturing. And again, we are very lucky that we have the political will. So for us, we are on the transition in our own country, but we're making sure to also help others. That's why in Africa Climate Week, we have um, uh, put forward a $4.5 billion fund to help the African countries in their transition because we understand how important funding is for this transition. Hope is, of course, the word you have, that you have mentioned that everybody wants to rally around. We have many young people also here uh, in the audience who I'm sure would very much uh, like the sound of, of your message. I will come back to you a little bit more about the ambitions that your country has, but I want to bring in Laurent, uh, Mr. President, here once more, because hope is one thing, but if we're looking at the naked numbers, energy still accounts for two-thirds of total greenhouse Gas. So the energy sector is still the central player in the efforts to reduce emissions and combat climate change. Now, it is very admirable to hear uh, Madam Minister talk about trying to wean itself off uh, fossil fuel in the long run, more diversification, more renewable energies. Uh, but are we really at a point right now where we can completely phase out fossil fuels. Uh, many people say, and Madam Minister, I, you're one of them who say that oil, gas and coal still have a role to play. So the, the balance that we're trying to do here, the, the movement towards renewables, while at the same time still being de dependent on fossil fuels, how do we uh, narrow that gap? It's, it's obviously one of the main difficulties of uh, this COP and of all the COPs. Uh, now, all of us, we read a lot of reports uh, and um, the main thing is uh, what is serious, what is not serious. As far as I'm concerned, uh, I take my positions uh, stemming on three elements. A, uh, the work of IPCC, because they are serious, they agree, there is a consensus. And when they write something, it's serious, IPCC. B, uh, International Energy Agency. They are very serious, and what they say, it's not nonsense. And C, more generally, what uh, the Secretary General of UN, uh, Mr. Guterres, says, because he's well informed, he's a reasonable man. And if, with my own judgment, I uh, am uh, stemming on these elements. I think if we want uh, Emirates Cup to be a success, we have three main objectives. I don't mean that they are easy, but it will be the success. The first one is about what we call global stock take. It's a bit technical, but it means that in Paris we have decided that periodically uh, Every single country has to deliver what we call a national determined contribution, saying, I will do that. And then it is checked. And this time uh, in Emirates, we have to see where we are, and we know that we'll be, we shall be off track, and where the different nations want to be in the future. The, fir the first element which will be decisive is how about this global stake take? The second one, is uh, obviously uh, about uh, energy. Uh, the idea is developed that there must be a real commitment at least to triple the renewable. And there are a lot of discussion about phasing down or phasing out of uh, fossil fuels. I will add, which is very important, the question of methane, CH4, which is less popular than CO2, but which is a decisive element and where we can get enormous results. Probably something like a diminishing of 75% till uh, 2030. And then, obviously, the question of finance, which will be decisive. What you said, Mariam, is uh, absolutely true. We have to make operational the loss and damage fund, it was about the only result of uh, the 27 COP, and we have to make it real. We have 
to make real the objective of $100 billion a year from the rich country to developing countries. It has been promised in 2009, and it ought to be delivered in 2020, and we are in 2023. And, obviously, uh, the question of investing more in renewable and disinvesting in fossil fuel. Because uh, otherwise, uh, the objective of a better balance uh, has no sense. And then there is, but it will take time, uh, the general reform of the international financial system, and especially the direction of developing countries, and especially in the direction of Africa, because they are not responsible for the emissions, and uh, they have not enough money in order to get uh, the new, uh, the renewable, and so on and so forth. Therefore, if we are able, if we are able to reach these elements, uh, COP28 uh, will remain as important as uh, Paris COP. Stressing the need to balance the green transition with affordability and energy security inclusivity, you've already mentioned, uh, Madam uh, Minister will be very high on the agenda of COP28 uh, and of course the question is always switching off fossil fuels and solely depending on clean and renewable energy net zero by 2050 is what your country has uh, set out to do we're in 2023 that's not too long from now no it's not too long so we announced our strategic initiative which is net zero by 2050 uh, that was in 2021 Last year at Sharm el-Sheikh, we actually announced our pathway, so where we want to be every five years when it comes to emissions. That's already been set for the country. And now we're actually looking into the how, how we're going to reach it, what policies, which sectors need to be involved, what projects, where should the money go? All that is being discussed now heavily in the UAE.